In the first few minutes of his adventure, Dr. Gordon Freeman arrives at the anomalous materials lab, puts on his hazardous environment suit, meets up with his fellow scientists in the test chamber, and pushes a sample of unknown origins into the anti-mass spectrometer, causing a resonance cascade and setting off the events of the series. In the first few minutes of his adventure, Corporal Adrian Shepard of the Special Forces of the United States Marine Corps arrives at Black Mesa with his comrades via Osprey as a response to the disaster, only to be shot down by alien forces and having to fight his way out through hordes of the zombified remains of his former friends. In the first few minutes of his adventure, Security Officer Barney Calhoun arrives at his job via tram, fails to get let inside, obtains a sidearm and uniform required for his task of fixing an elevator, has to take a detour to get there after his tram fails to show up, only to get berated by a scientist for being late. He then goes on to have my favorite adventure in the entire Half-Life series. But why? Why is the Half-Life title described by Civi as remarkably, inexpressibly dull, my favorite one? The short answer? Exactly that. The long answer? Because it's a game about people. Let me ask you something. How often in your life have you come across someone struggling with a problem and you chimed in with your own solution, either to actually help or just to make yourself look competent? And then a higher up came along to ruin the entire thing just because you're not at your actual job. How often has your train or bus been late or just not arrived at all, resulting in a weird unspoken camaraderie with the other passengers because you're all stuck together in the same situation? How often have you complained with a peer about a common problem, both of you knowing full well that it wasn't going to be fixed because the matter is outside your hands and no one else bothers? How often were you faced with such a problem and you had to figure out a solution yourself, despite being aware of the fact that you wouldn't get any praise nor acknowledgement for it? Or simply, how often have you come into work to aid your understaffed colleagues, only to suffer for it later on in every single way, wondering why you even bothered in the first place? Well, our little friend Barney experiences all of these things within minutes of starting the game. I think that, maybe somewhat unfortunately, the game peaks at the intro because of that. Why? Because it shows the little things. And they make it all worth it. You start outside Black Mesa at the personnel dormitories, something we've never seen before or since. And yet, it's nothing special at all. It's just some random buildings, absolutely uninteresting for the law of Half-Life. And yet, Barney lives there, because where else would he? As you ride the tram through the facility, you don't see important machines operating or expensive robots carrying cargo, you don't see missiles or helicopters, and you certainly don't see the aftermath of a nuclear waste spill. What you see is scientists and other guards playing games while waiting for the laundry to be finished. You see them eating their lunch in restaurants, arrive at work, or just have a moment together to chat about random nonsense. The most interesting thing you'll see is a football, lying in the transit railway area. A guard is seen running away from it, one not wearing any armor, implying they're not working. The question is, did he accidentally kick the football there, then panic upon realizing he's not gonna be able to get it back, and then bail to not get in trouble, like a schoolboy running away from a broken window? It's a more intimate side of Black Mesa. One that doesn't concern itself with creating large set pieces to establish the setting or create a larger world, grasping outwards to claim as much space as possible in order to say, I'm here, I'm important, look at me, defining a generation. Instead, it looks inwards and explores what these people that work there do, what their lives and personalities are like. And ironically, it creates a larger world doing so. The part between stepping off the tram to when disaster strikes is honestly my favorite part of the entire intro, maybe even the entire game. Everyone is just going about their days. There's guards doing gun training at the range, or struggling to do so, with the overseer reading a magazine, probably bored out of his mind because there's nothing else to do. Other guards are being chastised by the scientists, being blamed for issues they can't solve. And some of them are just doing their jobs or getting ready for the day. All of them agree, today is going to suck. But what can you do? Another day, another dollar. You just try to keep your chin up and do the best you can to deal with all this mess. And deal with it you do, just without any fanfare. Once you arrive, you have to gather your armor and gun yourself. But no one tells you where to go, you have to figure it out yourself, simply by following signs and colorful lines along the walls. There's no intense music blaring once you obtain them, it just happens. 
No one is giving grand speeches about how important this day is and how big your role in it is. I mean, why would they make a big deal out of any of these? It's your job. You do this every day. You stumble upon a problem? <laughs> Tough luck! You have to figure out a solution yourself. The area with a dark tunnel demonstrates this best. You're already having to find your own detour and push a barrel aside, but now you can't even see where you're going. Well, you have a flashlight. But then, what if someone else comes along who doesn't have one? Luckily, there's a hidden light switch behind the door. Unfortunately, it doesn't work since it's out of power. And so, you have to go out of your way to turn the generator back on to fix it. That little, optional and frankly unnecessary puzzle feels so organic and… real. I can definitely imagine myself being in such a situation and just guessing the solution, hoping it's right. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but at least I gave it my best shot. And in my opinion, this little puzzle sets the tone of the rest of the game. Story time. When I went to the USA in 2019, it was my first time ever flying on a plane and I had no idea what I was doing whatsoever. I had to figure it out all by myself from scratch by reading tram route plans and looking at signs and numbers on walls. At one point, I had to catch my next plane within minutes. I barely knew where to go and once I got there, everyone else had already boarded. I just showed my passport, always have your passport, and hope for the best. It felt scary, yet also exciting. As if I was solving puzzles in my own little game. And I love doing stuff like that, just following instructions on my own. As I was riding along on those airport trams at the time, I thought I felt like Gordon, exploring the depths of Lake Mesa. But in hindsight, I felt more like Barney, just some guy doing his best. If Blue Shift had had the guts, it would have pulled that off the entire way. Barely any weapons or even combat, no cinematic shootouts with the military and no teleportation spectacle at the end. Just a guy following instructions and trusting his guts, trying to get out of Black Mesa. I wouldn't even have minded if most of the game took place before the Resonance Cascade, showing more interactions with other people while nothing special is going on, like the intro to Twilight Princess. Why yes, I do love walking simulators, glad you asked. It could have been a more puzzle-orientated game compared to Opposing Forces combat-orientated gameplay. Which, of course, wouldn't have been possible because Blue Shift was meant to be a Dreamcast add-on and was developed before Opposing Force, but still. I actually once had a dream that was similar to my descriptions. I was playing a Half-Life experience in VR, it even had the pistol from Half-Life Alex. It was a co-op situation with another player, where the both of us had to escape a room before the Resonance Cascade happened, otherwise both of us would die instantly. We had to open panels and activate switches by manually using keys from our keychains to unlock them, and even get folding ladders to reach higher places and activate buttons there. I know that there are several VR games exactly like this, but I feel that the intimacy and simplicity would work really well for a character such as Barney. It could even work for real, as searching a single room in VR is better than large buildings, and the co-op aspect could function like in Half-Life Decay, where one person solves a puzzle, while the other one defends him from monsters. I just think that such a game centered around doing menial tasks would fit Barney as a character perfectly, much like he does in Blue Shift. Valve created Gordon as a more relatable character to play as than the grizzled average space marine or sunglasses wearing himbo. But I can't relate to a theoretical physicist who is a highly trained professional that constantly hangs out with other equally smart scientists. The only thing I can relate to in regards to Gordon is his ability to accidentally, or intentionally, misuse kitchen machinery. I can, however, relate to a blue collar worker who has to endure everyone looking down on him and blaming him for everything going wrong even though none of it is his fault. Someone who puts on his pants one leg at a time before venturing out into the cruel, unforgiving world of labor," said the YouTuber, comfortably writing this passage from the convenience of his own home. But come on, Barney is just the most average Joe there is. Literal blue-collar job aside, he's also in his second year of college with an undecided major and believes in government conspiracies. As if he knows his life sucks because he lacks any sort of goal, and so he attempts his best to give it some sort of purpose. And don't we all? It just makes him one of the most relatable video game characters out there, right next to I push buttons for a living Stanley and I've never seen my kids grow up once, Olima. They're not super strong or super smart or super charismatic, they're the everyman. And that's precisely why he's my favorite Half-Life character. Incidentally, I kind of prefer his German dub. Not because it's high quality, oh no. He's mostly just reading his lines, which reminds me of when developers voice characters in their own games for budgetary reasons. But that's why I love it so much, because he sounds so bored. Mir wurde ausdrücklich gesagt, dass ich dich ohne Schutzanzug hier nicht durchlassen darf. Das ist die falsche Luftschleuse, Gordon. Du weißt doch, dass ich dich hier nicht durchlassen darf. Du sollst auf jeden Fall presto runterkommen, sobald du deinen Schutzanzug an hast. Hat das nicht Zeit bis später? Das ist mal wieder so ein Tag, den man besser aus dem Kalender streicht. 
The German dub is a gem in its own right, but this absolute boredom of a random worker perfectly being conveyed through Barney is pure genius. This man is no one special, he's someone you come across every single day. The game even directly spells out to the player that Barney is not important. No, I don't mean that, not important. I mean the way it explains its priorities in the events of a disaster. First and foremost is securing Black Mesa equipment. Secondly, ensuring the safety of the other personnel. And thirdly, with the lowest priority, almost like they were legally required to add this as a footnote, comes his own personal safety. He is worth less to Black Mesa than the cup he drinks coffee out of. It literally doesn't matter to them a single bit whether he lives or dies. I really love that detail, because while we know Black Mesa does shady business, it's still portrayed as a futuristic facility where the future of tomorrow happens today. And yet it's stuck in the past, with a mentality we see all too often in corporations even these days. Even Barney's whole adventure is unremarkable. You don't get a fancy HEV suit and you also can't access any of the HEV panels, who almost seem to mock you for not being able to do so. You don't receive any cool experimental science weapons or weird otherworldly alien guns, because those are reserved for the big boys. Nope, you get your vest and your pistol and there's your lot. The strongest weapon you'll find is the rocket launcher, maybe the satchel charges, but even those are rare. And remember that amazing LMG that Adrian used? It's mounted to a surface here, being used exactly once. You don't go to any interesting or atmospheric locations, everything is small and claustrophobic and insignificant. There's no breathtaking cliffside or dam sections with a chopper hunting you, no landmines or James Bond-esque laser navigation. Instead, you'll march through sewers, offices, tunnels, sewers, random industrial hallways, sewers, train yards, cargo bays and more sewers. These places are so utterly devoid of life or interesting qualities. Even the train you do end up using only goes a few meters. There's not even any interesting laboratories or scientific equipment, it's literally just random hallways connecting everything. And so us. Even this trip through Zen consists of a few rooms, tunnels and crawl spaces, like they happen to teleport you to the most backwater part of the planet. Heck, even the tutorial level is just completely recycled from Half-Life. Like the game is just giving you leftover scraps of a much more interesting adventure that were cut out, but didn't want to let to go to waste. And I know I pressed the puzzles of the game at the beginning, but really, the most interesting one is the one that requires you to push a box into water. And even then it's highly unintuitive, because my first instinct was always to shoot it immediately. I mean, there's enemies right next to it. Oh, speaking of those enemies, there's barely any. The soldiers don't care about you much, they just shoot at you because you're witness to everything and that's their orders. But they hold no grudge against you in particular and will certainly not write a threatening message about you with 12 spelling errors on a wall. At one point, they lock you into a freight container and immediately ask for the status on Freeman because he's much more important than a random security guard. And Zen's flora and fauna are also pretty lackluster here. It's the standard affair of headcrabs and vortigons. The biggest threat you see is the alien grunts, maybe the alien controllers. In some levels, you can hear soldiers fighting and the gargantua stomping around in the distance, but you never see any of that. For crying out loud, the boss battle in this one isn't even a floating space baby or giant space worm, it's a bunch of random soldiers. It's as if both Zen and the US government agreed that you aren't enough of a threat to justify using the big guns. That even when you cut through their forces, it's just a drop on a hot stone and can be almost entirely ignored. And it's not just them. Gee man, the person presumably writing the report on Gordon, Adrian and you doesn't even give you the time of the day. You see him once at the beginning as you're trudging through a sewer, but he never reappears and nor does he ever talk to you. And at the end he basically just lets Barney go without any other interference. Out of range it says, as if you couldn't just pluck him out of space and time at any point. Barney is so utterly unimportant to G-Man that it makes me wonder if the report was just a standard procedure he had to make, not one he was interested in. Because thematically that would fit best for the game, like not even one of the most powerful beings in the entire universe is exempt from boring office work. And the ending conveys that theme of sheer unimportance perfectly. You're now in old Black Mesa. Everything is run down and outdated, brilliantly symbolized by the incredibly old health and HEV charging stations and hand scanners instead of eye scanners. It's not a super secret location that no one knows about and which hides dark secrets like in Portal 2, it's just part of the facility that's outdated and has been replaced by the new Lambda Labs. Literally no one would care about this place if there wasn't an emergency, a quality it very much shares with Barney. The scientists just have to make do with what they got to get the world's tiniest teleporter running. But the goal isn't even to use it to stop a giant reality tearing monster or anything of the sort. 
They just want to escape Black Mesa. They're not even fully prepared like the ones in Gordon's case. You have to go to Zen first to activate a device there and then charge a battery so you can teleport in the first place. They don't know if it'll work properly, they're just trying to make do with what they have. Again, much like Barney. And thanks to him, it does work. He didn't save everyone by stopping an alien invasion or by preventing a nuke from going off. Though even the other two failed at both of those. All he succeeded in doing was saving the lives of four people, himself included. But even if it had been just one person, or just Barney, or even if he had died trying, it would have been worth it. Because giving his best is all he could, and that's all he did. In the end, it's just a few lives amongst billions. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But it matters to those few lives in particular, those individuals, those people. And that's what the game is about. I probably overanalyzed everything. The most likely reason for the game being so boring, simple and empty is probably just that it was Gearbox's first attempt at doing a Half-Life add-on. But I'm sure that Barney's unimportance was intentional, on some level at least. Because even the earliest trailer for the game, when it was still called Guard Duty, calls it out. You're not a hero, you're not a villain, you're just stuck in the middle. I feel we need more games like these, where the boring every person has their own little adventure that's not too special in the big picture and where not many interesting things happen, but it's special to them. Everyone wants to be an Adrian and thinks of themselves as a Gordon, but we have to accept that at the end of the day, we're all a Barney. And that's absolutely fine. Because even being a Barney can be rewarding in itself, enriching not just the lives of other people, but your very own.